Um, I usually ask, uh, how many people's from Eastern Kentucky? Just two? There's usually quite a few from Eastern I'm from Eastern Kentucky. You can't tell by the way I talk, I know. Um, Central Kentucky. All right, that's more. Oh, you guys all hang together, huh? Uh, Kentucky, period. So almost everybody. Out of state? Where are you from? Connecticut? Did you get lost? <laughs> yeah. Where are you from? Ohio. Ohio? Florida. Florida. Love these winners? <laughs> Anybody else out of state? No? Right. Yeah, it used to be a lot of people from Cincinnati came to Eastern. I don't know if that still holds true or not. Everybody, is this business, all business related? Students? Business? Everybody business? Anybody not business? Probably the best thing to ask. All age groups? What level? Seniors? Probably, probably sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Any freshmen? Sophomores? Juniors and seniors. Yeah. yeah. I used to be able to pick them out, but the older you get, the younger everybody looks. So it gets harder and harder to do. And uh, just so you know, I, I did, um, when they first approached me on this, I'm not really, I'm not, a, well, not really, I'm not an orator at all. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm more of a conversationalist, so um, we will, we'll, uh, I've got some things that I will say, and then what I would like to do is leave enough time, how much time do I have? How much time do you want? Oh. <laughs> they just, they're all getting ready to leave. <laughs> so, uh, leave some room for Q&A, because a lot of times when I come down here to talk to students, um, I do Q&A, and uh, uh, my original thought was that that you guys may get more out of that because you really don't care too much about who I am or what I do as much as where you're going and what you want to learn, and I get that. But um, I will say the ones that we've done that, uh, I've actually learned a lot from the students, and I've been uh, very pleasantly um, surprised at how smart and enabled you guys are to get out into the workforce. So EKU does a great job with that, and you guys should all be proud of that. Yeah, sure. we got to introduce you here. All right. Um, I don't think you need me to have the microphone. I tend to project pretty well. I'm Dr. Mike Robertson. I'm chair of the MMIB department, and some of you know me from those frustrating BTS classes and everything. Um, just want to welcome you all. Uh, we, each year, each of our two departments in business recognizes one distinguished alumnus. And this year we've selected Mr. Dale Cooper. Um, we, we select this alumnus based on someone who has left Eastern with their Eastern degree and has done well in business, but has given back as uh, Mr. Cooper has coming back to classes. I know he's been to Dr. Allison's classes and perhaps others, and he serves on our business advisory council. And, and we appreciate his service back to us, but just in talking to him, uh, and I, I've not gotten to know Dale well until just the last month or so, but I uh, found him to be a real interesting guy with some neat projects that I think are going to be appealing to you that he can tell you about, as well as his experiences. Just to do a little bit of the formal kind of stuff. He's founder, CEO, and president. We've well, got three roles there of exact communication technology. Janitor, uh, too. <laughs> there you go. Uh, they provide a superior cloud-based wireless and traditional IP voice and data technology. He'll tell you more about that. He's held other leadership positions such as founder and president of eSquared Communications, director of sales for Nuvox. General Manager and President of Galaxy Distributing. He's a 1980 graduate of Eastern Kentucky University with a BBA, which is great because that's where we are right now, just in a different building, Dale. Than yeah, yeah. Much better one. Much better building. Uh, you remember a Sigma Pi fraternity? Yes. And uh, you guys were pretty good in intramural sports, I think, when you were here, right? Well, I was here, yeah. Champs in football and Can't softball. you tell I'm an athlete? <laughs> <laughs> He's a 76th graduate of Lewis County High School, uh, played football, baseball, National Honor Society. 
as I mentioned, he's on the Business Advisory Council, a group of business leaders who come and advise uh, us here in, in business, very valuable group. Uh, he's a member of several local associations in Lexington, a member and deacon of Emmanuel Baptist Church, and is, is married and has two children. Anything else we should say about you? No. Well, take it away and just thanks for being with us. You all caught the key word when he says interesting? That pretty much sums me up. Uh, so, first of all, let me say that um, when um, they approached me, I, I was honored, humbled, and I also say I'm blessed. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, a little later. But uh, uh, glad to be here to speak with you and uh, share what little bit of knowledge I have. Uh, I'm. Uh, we were just talking to one guy a while ago, and it's like, I'm going to tell you just up front, there's a whole lot of people, a lot more people out in the world that's smarter than me. There's a whole lot more people that are um, more talented than me. But the one thing that um, I would challenge anybody with is nobody can outwork me. And so um, I say that not to say anything about myself as much, but just to let you know is never be discouraged you are who you are, um, and you are the way you were made. But find out what makes you best, and then then build upon that. There's a lot of people that will prescribe to um, try to be good at everything. Who wants to be good? Anybody want to be, in here want to be good? You want to be good? I I want to be great. You know, at whatever I do, and I didn't mean to. <laughs> Put you out, but, but uh, the uh, it's okay being good. It's better than being bad. Uh, but the, uh, the what I'm saying about that is you are uniquely made for a reason. Okay, and so capitalize on that reason and become the best you that you can be. I think that's a military term. But um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. And one of the reasons uh, I say I'm blessed is. Uh, July the 15th, I had open heart bypass surgery. And um, I had a, uh, had, uh, had to do a five-way uh, operation. And uh, when the doctor told me that, I'm like, I've never even heard of five-way except in Chile, you know? And uh, so uh, anyway, that's about as funny as I get. But um, I, I had that. Uh, I recovered. Um, I feel, I mean, really, I didn't know how bad I did feel. But even when I felt bad, I'll tell you, you still couldn't outwork me, okay? Because bottom line is you do what you got to do until you get it done and get it done the way you want to do it. Now, I'm an entrepreneur, so it may be different if, you're, if your goal is to work for somebody else. You still should still do the best that you can do, but you may not want to kill yourself doing it. Um, so I'm from northeastern Kentucky. Uh, a little town called Vanceburg. Anybody heard of Vanceburg? Oh, really? Um, it's very small. I, I don't have many. I haven't lived there since 19, um, well, since 1976, really, when I came over here. But um, had, had a lot of family there and, and so forth. But it's on the Ohio River between Maysville and Portsmouth, Ohio. So very rural area and uh, <clears throat> not a lot of opportunities. Uh, if you're not a teacher or work for the state in some fashion, you are probably a farmer. When I grew up, both of my granddads were farmers. I helped them a few times, and I learned really quickly that I did not want to be a farmer. That is hard work. My one grandfather was a dairy farmer. 365 days a year. You can't take off or the cows go dry. So it's just, you know, automate that. I'm not there for that. Uh, but uh, so I decided to come to Eastern to go to school. Now, where I'm from, most people went to Moorhead and because uh, it's only 30 miles away. And uh, I've always been different. I decided to come to Eastern. Well, never really thought a whole lot about it. Didn't even make a decision. Back then, you could make a decision kind of at the last minute because everything was manual. And uh, I did take an ACT just in case I wanted to come. Uh, but I decided in July come to school in August, I think it was, and uh, and just give you another uh, 
thing in time is I think my first semester, my uh, room and board in school uh, was six hundred and seventy-five dollars. So you guys probably paid seven hundred or something, didn't you? <laughs> for, books. <laughs> for books, yeah, yeah, that's the killer books. Um, so uh, I'm the first in my family to ever go to college. My dad went to the fifth grade. You could quit school when you wanted to back then. And uh, he figured he knew as much or more than a teacher, so he quit school in fifth grade. Um, my mom went to high school, got a high school degree, but they both became entrepreneurs. And I guess that's how I'm wired to be an entrepreneur because I tried corporate world when I got out of college and um, did it for uh, several years, uh, probably 14 or 15 total. And I was just a uh, round peg in a square hole. I just never did fit in. Um, I, uh, I'm always the guy that um, some people learn to dislike because when somebody says, do this, and I'm like, well, why are we not doing it this way? That goes, because I told you to do it this way. I mean, I, my brain doesn't think that way. My brain thinks about how to do something better or fix something or, you know, create a, a better product or whatever. So I uh, did that for as long as I could take it. Uh, I was a district director for the state for the company I worked for and um, just more than anything wasn't happy, so I decided to start my own business. Uh, I was telling the class earlier today is a good thing about being your own boss. Um, anybody here want to be an entrepreneur? Nobody. Or oh, one, maybe. It was slow, so maybe. I'll give you a maybe. <laughs> it's, uh, it's good because, you know, you, you get to be friends with the boss. You uh, never disagree with the boss. You can do whatever the boss says. Uh, but the boss never pays you enough. So just remember that. And it is hard work because it all comes back to you. And uh, you never know what work is until you're racing to the mailbox to see if there's enough money in there to make payroll. That's what startups do. That's what entrepreneurs do is sometimes you don't know when it's coming in. You're just trying to make the best of it as you can. So uh, graduated in 80, like they said, uh, BBA, uh, Sigma Pi, fraternity. Um, my wife uh, met her at school here. And, um, and I got a son, Kevin, and a, and a daughter, Jacqueline. Um, so I've started four businesses. Uh, still have three of them. Uh, two of them are pretty mature. One of them's uh, 12 years in existence. The other one's seven. Um, and then the third one, I'm uh, just launching. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But the one thing um, in starting the three businesses that I have is, uh, just like I said, entrepreneurialism is hard. It really is hard. But it's also very rewarding. So it just depends on what you want out of your life where you go. Some people are happy with just getting a good job, showing up every day, and uh, getting a nice paycheck, and they go home to the family, and, and you know, that's, that's what they want to do, and there's nothing wrong with that. It, but you are individuals, and you should think as an individual, um, kind of like I did when I came to Eastern, it's just because everybody else does something don't mean you have to join the, the beehive group and join in with them. You can do your own thing because that's the way you're created. So the um, uh, biggest thing I like to do, uh, anybody else in here dreamers? Nobody? One? So that's what I would have guessed when I asked that. And uh, one thing I think that we miss today is because everything is like reality now. Uh, it's all in our face. And I wonder if sometimes we forget how to dream. And to me at least, and I'm just speaking for myself, I love to do that. I love to think, what if? Why not? What could be? And if you just think about this a little bit, and I'll challenge you to maybe think a little deeper on this at a later time, but, you know, today with technology and everything we have, uh, there's no better time in history that I know of that anything is possible. Virtually anything is possible. So if you can, I think Walt Disney actually said it, if you can dream it, 
you can do it. And I really believe in that. So I, I wanted to just challenge you a little bit to think about that because nobody has to put you in a box. Nobody has to um, say, you know, because um, I, I, was, I was in that. You know, my dad had his own businesses, and he wanted me to come to school, learn stuff maybe that he would now admit he didn't know going to the fifth grade, and I could come home and help him. But I didn't want to be in that box. So that wasn't like really um, always uh, fun, warm discussions. And I actually did work him for a little bit a little later. Uh, but um, it's, um, you know, you are individually, like I said, made, and you can do things that other people can't do. You may not have discovered that yet, but there's things that you can do that other people can't do. But the only way you can release that is to dream. So I just challenge you to consider dreaming. Uh, I love to dream, and uh, like I said, I'm not real smart. So what I look for is problems. When I see something that needs fixed, I'm a fixer. So I thought, okay, how could I do that? How could I fix that issue? Sometimes it's not. it seems really simple. Sometimes it's more complex. But uh, it's gotten me a long way in life because everybody has problems, right? Anybody here don't have problems? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> um, so... Um, one of the things that uh, I'm doing, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in Q&A if you want to, but um, I'm, I'm getting of age now to where, you know, I'm thinking about uh, and dreaming about what can I do to give back. And that's the reason I come down here. I mean, I enjoy, enjoy doing this kind of thing just because, not that I, I know that much, but if I could give you some real workplace facts or, you know, whatever it may be that could help you, then that's what I want to do. And so um, the, uh, one, the business I just launched is called Zoom Broadband. And uh, basically we've got a contract with the uh, state of Kentucky to supply um, high-speed broadband to rural Kentucky. Um, where I'm from, the best thing they can get is a DSL that's like 6 meg down and 512 up. Well, the reason they can't get plants to locate there is because plants all run on computers. And computers need more than six down and five twelve up, and um, but they also need. I can get that there, but it's astronomical because I got to go through Windstream or AT and T. So the only way to create that is on the new uh, Kentucky Wired network that all of our tax money is paying for. That uh, is a ten gig end to end network. So again, dreaming. What could you do? with 10 gig of internet in rural Kentucky. You can do the same thing in there that you can do in Lexington or Louisville or Cincinnati or whatever. Broadband is what runs the world now or everything runs on broadband, maybe a better way to say it. So uh, I'm doing that. I'm trying to do public-private uh, relationships uh, to give back to the communities and let them own their own network. And I just do the heavy lifting stuff on compliancy and billing and all that kind of stuff for them. So, uh, uh, my wife's not happy with me on doing that because she still wants me to retire. But uh, um, she's retired. But the um, so she goes, well, you just don't want to be home with me. I'm like, no, it's not doing that. But the uh, heart surgery I had, doctor told me that uh, honeydew lists were off the list. I can't, I can't do those things. So I don't want to fight over that. But uh, uh, so now I want to talk a little bit more about about you than just me, but. Um, I would, like I said again, encourage you um, to dream, but also uh, wherever you're at right now in your life, be very thankful for that because you're in, you're in the spot that you are right now for a reason to go to the spot you're going to be going to as you graduate. So don't look at it as a woe is me kind of thing. Be thankful for that. Uh, how many people in here uh, make plans, like schedules, and and you you run your life by a plan or schedule? Well, a lot of us do that. Uh, one of the things I will um, say about that is even the best plans, the best plans, are never fully tried out and done, because when I grew up, I was telling these guys earlier. We did five, you're not going to believe this, but we used to do, we'd go to the bank and try to get money. You'd, you'd have to give them a five to ten year business plan. 
five to ten years. Do you know what all has been created in the last ten years of your life? It's like amazing. You Google that sometimes and see what all new products in the last ten years. So now the business plans are six months to twelve months because generally speaking, I'm in technology, in, in six months, things have changed. There's something new out. There's something better out. You know, whatever. And you, you guys see that. I'm, you, you grew up with technology. So be thankful for the friends you've met while you're in school. Um, try your best to stay connected. You know, I said I was in Sigma Pi fraternity. Um, we are now on our 38th, or we just completed our 38th anniversary of our fall retreat that we have right here in Richmond, Kentucky. Everybody comes back and we have a golf scramble out at Gibson Bay. And we all stay connected. Uh, so you may not believe this today, but there's potentially a lot of people that you've met here or friended here that will be lifelong friends for you. Those are resources for you. They are people you can help. They are people that can help you. Uh, you're going to need that. The world's pretty cold anymore, and you're going to need those kind of people. Um, hopefully everybody in here is having the time of their life while they're in school. Because I don't want it to be a downer, but life's not going to get much funner than what you're experiencing right now. There's going to be a lot of hard stuff ahead of you. You you know, some of you will get married. Some of you will have kids. Some of you, you got all these responsibilities. Generally speaking, um, you know, most, when you're in college, it's whatever, whatever Dale wants to do, whatever, you know, Joe wants to do, or whatever. You're on your own. It's a great time. Um, so whatever your major is, and, um, some of the professors may not like this statistic, but I knew it was low, but I didn't, know how low it was, but do you realize how much passion plays in your life? Because there's a reason what they say is do what you have a passion for. And the reason they say that is that if you really enjoy your job, it's not a job. You enjoy it. But most of us don't do that. And the reason is we're chasing dollars, we're chasing uh, levels or whatever it may be. And statistics says that only 27% of gra college graduates actually work in the field they went to school with. Four. 27%. So that means that all these people over here may not do what, what you're studying in college. Maybe. You know? So make sure that your choice is, um, what you really enjoy doing. Can't stress that enough. Um, and that's the reason I want you to dream. Because dreaming is what tells you what your passion is. Uh, I, I don't dread going into work since I've been my own boss. My boss doesn't dread seeing me every day. You know? I mean, that's a good thing for me. You need to get yourself in a position where you're that way too that you just love what you're doing. If you do, you'll have a great career. And you will probably rise to the top. Um, the world is yours to take. There's been no other time in history that I can even fathom thinking about that has the uh, chance of success that you have. Right now, for those of you graduating, we're, in the, we're probably in at least one of the best economies ever. There's a million and a half jobs out there wanting somebody to get hired. And they don't have enough people to, to take those jobs. So that goes back to, um, you know, it may not be a job you want. But anyway, the, the job market is so tight that you have a lot of options. It's almost like the uh, housing market now. My neighbor just sold their house. And I think they were asking like... Um, 190,000 for it or something, and uh, they got offered 220. I'm like, they told me that. I'm like, how's that work? And I said, I thought you were only wanting 190 for it. And they go, well, there's such a shortage of houses in Lexington that people will bid up that price. I, it may have happened before, but I don't ever remember it. So you can be that way when you're out there looking for a job. 
Don't take a job just because you want a job, even though your parents may be screaming at you, get a job. You know, get a job you want. If you don't, if you're entrepreneurial and you can't get the job you want, create your own job. Follow your heart. Your heart knows where you should go. Don't try to overthink it. Don't try to reconcile, you know, well, this pays this and this pays that. You know, we all do that. We're all human. And uh, we can overthink things. But follow your heart. Um, it will take care of all your decisions. It will take care of your whole career and your life. Always be happy with yourself. Again, with your friends, whether it's in school or people you work with, network. I can't tell you how much networking has paid off in my life. When I came to school at Eastern, uh, this would be hard for you guys to fathom, but uh, I'd never been this far away from home, which is not that far, uh, without my parents or some family member or something with me. So it's only like, you know, two hours away. Now today, you know, people go all over the world and, and whatever, so it's a totally different world. But when you take time to invest in others, and they will invest back into you, sometimes you will find great job opportunities by somebody that you know that works there. When I first got out of college, one of the first accounts I closed was a fraternity brother, was a uh, procurement uh director, I don't know what his title was then, but anyway, he made those decisions on who to purchase that product from. So the only thing I had to do was be competitive, and he was most likely going to give it to me, or else get my wrath. But uh, So anyway, I got the biggest deal at that point in time that the company had sold. And uh, actually one of the managers, when I brought the paperwork back in, said, we can't sell that, they're too big. And I'm like, how is anything too big? You know, that's me. Uh, she didn't think we could handle it. But I sent it to the people, not at corporate, not at r local, and they go, sure, we can do that. We'll take care of it. So network with others. Uh, you should be very thankful for the professors that you've had here and not just their knowledge and their experiences that they have taught you, but, you know, ask and you never can tell. They may be able to help you with what you need. You know, it's just, it's just, it's a strange world. Uh, they were asking about, in this ethics class, they were asking me if, you know, what if I had a kid that needed medicine and um, I didn't have the money to pay for it. If I stole it, would I be doing something wrong since I was actually helping my kid? And um, my answer to that is that's a personal decision that you make, so I can't answer for everybody. But to me, the way I would do that is ask a family member or a friend or whatever, can I borrow 20 bucks or 50 bucks if I didn't have it to get this medicine for my kid? Most people love to help other people. You need to love to help other people too. So rely on that. So um, now I want to uh, get more back to you, but... Um, when I was talking about plans, and almost everybody had schedules or plans or whatever, um, let me tell you, even the best of plans don't work. And um, if you ask, you know, there's a lot of theories out there about companies that are overnight success, like Amazon or something like that. It's not overnight. The guy started the business like 25 years ago. You know, a lot of hard work, probably tough times. But the path of success is not like this. It's very messy. It's scribbly all over the place. You know, it just nothing makes sense. So you can do these plans, but be strong enough to, and, and have a low enough ego to where you can say, hey, I need to make changes. What I thought would happen wasn't in reality, didn't work out. That's okay. Even if something fails and don't work, that's okay. You learn something from that. Adapt, move forward. The only time you lose is uh, is if you get give up or quit. And um, nobody wants to be a quitter. So um, what uh, I'm going to leave you with, and then we'll do a little Q&A.
Um, I'd rather do that anyway, but um, I'm not real good at this kind of stuff. But um, when you make these plans, always I, I always use the term have your antennas up. And what I mean by that is observe what's going on around you because you will see situations that are brought to you out of accident or out of somebody having a big need that you go like, hey, I know a way to fix that. And you can fix it. And it can be uh, in a corporate world or it can be entrepreneurial. Um, I was telling a story about this guy from Egypt that I met because a friend introduced me to him. Um, I was new in the telecom industry and um, we had this little machine. You guys probably never heard of prepaid phone cards, but back in the day, they used to charge for long distance. So especially if it was Mexico or Europe or Canada or whatever, the price per minute was very expensive. And so we had this machine that nobody had ever sold it. It was a product that they developed. Nobody had ever sold it. And I got to looking it up and reading about it. I called a guy at corporate, and he told me, and I'm like, why is nobody selling this? He goes, I don't know. It just never has taken off. So used to be on those prepaid phone cards, you know, uh, parents would buy them to give to you uh, going to school, but uh, a lot of Spanish-speaking people would buy them, and they would call home uh, and things like that. But um, the vendors had to pay cash up front for that card before they even sold it. So it was an inventory. Because it was a little small card on a placard, uh, they got stolen a lot. So this was a, like a credit card machine that you put this little thermal card in, and it would thermal print on that card the, the information for the long-distance call. And they didn't have to pay for it until they actually sold it. So they got the retail amount and their profit before they had to pay the vendor. And so with my antennas up, I'm like, that makes too much sense. That should be easy to sell. So I went and talked to this Egyptian guy who sold these, and I asked him, well, lo and behold, he started buying millions of minutes a month from me. My last commission check that I got from them was $15,000 for that one account. Only because I was willing to ask a question and find a solution for him. Now, when I say my last one was because um, after about six months of getting those checks, they closed the office in Lexington, and uh, on December the 20th, we uh, all got pink slipped and uh, was told our insurance ended December 31st. Good luck. Um, so uh, a lesson learned was... Uh, Okay, I really have no loyalty to businesses anymore. I've just got a job. I'm going to do the best I can. You give me a check, but my loyalty is for me and so forth. So from then on, I looked at it differently. than Because when I grew up, you'd get a job with, you know, IBM or somebody, and you stayed there for 30 or 40 years, and then you retired. You know, but that, that's not realistic anymore in today's world. So keep those antennas up and be thinking about those things. And know on your business model that in your life you can see it more than ever, but it, the world is changing at blistering paces. So why would we think that a business model or your career plans would not change also? Maybe, hopefully not at the same pace, but it's going to change. Things are just different now. So you may have to, just to put it in a, a, a visionary form for you, you're going to hit roadblocks. And so... Instead of hitting a roadblock and say, oh, I don't like this job anymore, I'm going to get another job, or, you know, whatever. Stop, think about it, take a detour, figure out maybe you want another job inside the same company, maybe you want to go to a different company, whatever that may be, but do some thinking about it. Don't let your circumstances make your decisions. Almost, in other back of my life, almost every decision I made out of circumstances turned out to not be a very great decision sometimes really bad decisions. So think about um, things where you do it. And you may have to just pull over and take a rest or a time out or something and just focus just on the decision you need to make. Clear your head and uh, consider all the options. Um, but again, I'll go back to dream because the impossible in your world today is possible. 
you can be part of that as long as you don't quit and you keep seeking what that dream or what that vision is. So don't cut yourself short. Don't settle. Um, elevate. You know, the great thing can happen about having over high, overly high expectations is that even if you fail 10, 20 percent, you still did pretty darn good. Don't set your expectations down here just to survive. Exceed and thrive. That's what I would challenge you to do. So, um, blaze your own trail. You're your own person. Create your own destiny. Um, Winston Churchill said, success is never a failure. Failure is never fatal. It is courage that counts. So, have courage. If you're ever going to have courage, have, have courage based on your own abilities and go out there and just see what is possible. You might surprise yourself. Um, so I, I come, I've come down here to uh, Lee Allison's classes and did some Q&As. Has anybody been in those that's in here? Good. Don't ask me the same questions. <laughs> But um, so I like doing that a lot. Um, Mr. Roberson told me that um, I could do Q and A's with you. So the only downside to the Q and A's is if you don't ask questions, he told me to keep on talking. So that's your choices. So what I'd like to do is open it up. Don't be shy. Ask me anything you want. I'll do my best to answer it, uh, especially on a on a career or a. Uh, any kind of uh, question you got on that? Raise your hand if you want to start. I have a question. Yes. I live five minutes down Lancaster Avenue and I have horrible internet. <laughs> How can Zoom become my favorite company on the face of the earth? Well, I'd love to make that happen for you. Um, but well, I mean, it's my whole neighborhood. It's yeah. What we're doing is something called fixed wireless, and it's interesting in technology how things, what goes around just keep coming back and it recycles. Like now, the big buzzword has been for years, cloud. Everybody heard of the cloud? It's nothing different than when we had all of our stuff in data centers and we had mainframe computers and dummy terminals. It's kind of the same scenario. Uh, fixed wireless is like all the long distance calls used to be. You go into these towns. Uh, Richmond had some. Winchester probably had the most. But there was a cross section where you had all these big, huge towers and they had humongous satellite dishes on them. And that's how the calls were transmitted. Well, fixed wireless is just like that, except the antennas are only about that big now. Uh, and that's what we're using. Uh, in some more densely populated areas, we'll use fiber to the home. Uh, but uh, mainly uh, in rural areas, terrain, uh, all this kind of stuff, make up of uh, what you got to work with. Uh, fixed wireless is the least expensive because it's hard digging through mountains and you know stuff like that. So, what's the number of subscribers to make fixed wireless break even? Well, it, it depends on uh, you know what people want to do. I, I've got a buddy that's a customer of mine. Runs. Uh, he's a, uh, a wounded warrior. Actually, I think he used to teach some classes down here. Uh, Scott Arias. I don't know if that name rings a bell to anybody, but he uh, he's got his own uh, uh, defense. Uh, Construction company he does stuff for just party, and he's wanting me to come out there and do it for his neighborhood. So it can be done for as few as thirty or fifty people uh, if they're willing to pay the money to get that done. Uh, but um, uh, the Kentucky Wired Network will help because they've got the the state side is on Kentucky Wired. They have another uh, side of uh, fiber that's called Open Fiber, and they're wholesaling that to the last mile providers. So once we get that. Uh, temporarily, it should be cheaper than Windstream or AT&T. Uh, eventually, the markets will adjust, and you know whatever. Uh, in our business, we're always it's a great thing. It, it's a great thing for the consumer, not always for the businesses. But we're we're in a race to zero, pretty much in t technology at all times. So, uh, but consumers typically will pay anywhere between sixty bucks to eighty bucks, depending on the size of the bandwidth. Um, the um, factories and businesses uh, carry the bulk of the cost. 
So if you're located around some factories that can't get it, like industrial parks, we try to look at that. We can go in and we can actually sell it for the same thing as they're currently paying and give them two or three times the bandwidth. So it just kind of depends geographically where you're at. But um, if you want to send me the address, I'll look at it for you. Okay. Because they're... Oh, yeah. What was your hardest struggle for your uh, startup business and how did that overcome? Well, <laughs> it, it goes in phases because the, the bad thing about, um, well, not really bad, but the learning curve in a business is uh, the bigger you get, every one of those presents more, more problems, just different problems. So every time you scale, it's a different problem. So they're all probably equal. Uh, but if we're saying from beginning to end, um, a lot of people, I, I worked with uh, some people at the Kentucky uh, Economic Development helped me put my plan together. And um, as I was doing that, um, got, you know, I worked for, I'm telling you, weeks on this plan. And I thought, man, I've, I've changed it. I've, done, I've got it where it needs to be. And walked in and shared it with them. And, and uh, this older gentleman that also worked with UK, he looked at me and he says, good job. And I'm starting to puff up, you know, and, and he goes, now you got the easy part done. Now what are you going to do? So thinking of something, having an idea, is a, that's a great learning example. Is that, That's actually the easiest thing that you can do. So the, 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 the first hardest thing is how are you going to fund it? So unless you got really wealthy parents or family that wants to give you money, those are kind of few and far between nowadays, uh, you're going to have to go out and get it yourself. So I know you guys with uh, different things here, you have those kind of classes and those kind of presentations, but you got to put together that executive summary. you got to be willing to go out and ask people to trust you to give you money. So my first company that I did, um, we, uh, we started it with $100,000. <clears> And uh, we've made, you know, uh, probably $3 million off of it in 12 years, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, the second company that I've, is seven years old now, I raised a million dollars. Uh, so it gets easier to raise money after you have one success. But when you just got an idea, it's, it's relatively hard. Um, so, but I did that through private people that I know. And, uh, you know, it's probably different for everybody, but for me, asking people I know to give me money is a hard thing to do. It also may not be the best thing you can do because even though everybody gives you money with the expectation they could lose it all, nobody really wants to think about that. <laughs> they want to think that you're going to make them a million dollars. Right, so especially if you're doing it with family or friends, uh, this last one I raised a million. I've got seven fraternity brothers from Sigma Pi that give me various amounts of money. Um, thankful for it, but it also puts a lot more pressure on the entrepreneur because I got to perform now. I can't let everybody down. So, and one thing you don't really need is extra pressure because you've got all these other regular business pressures out there. Um, so, um, the, the best way would be to, if you're a really good talker and a really good, you know, strategist on that, that you can just go out and openly get money. But one thing that probably won't come to a surprise to you is money's not free. So even if they loan it to you, they expect interest. Uh, most of them want options. They can either have the interest or they can own part of the company. So you have to be really careful with the uh, what they call term sheet when they offer you the money, what the benchmarks are and everything because they could, uh, they could wind up taking the company from you if you don't meet certain expectations. So you, you have to have an attorney involved and do all that. I'm in a process now with Exact where I'm looking to do some mergers and acquisitions for um, growth in that manner plus the organic growth because technology doesn't wait for anybody so the longer it takes you the more likelihood you won't ultimately succeed so with that you go out and you talk to private equity 
or venture capitalist or you know family office type people that offer money and it's still not free and the expectations even get more and sometimes they can um, you know one guy said I'll do it but I want 90 percent of your company and so that was a place I wasn't willing to go but there's also the other side of this where I saw a guy a friend of mine give up 90 percent of his company and they brought in resources and money and now his 10 percent is worth more than what his 100 percent was so there's no really tried and true you know you got to go with your heart again and um, got to make sure that you're dealing with people you want to deal with because uh, it can be pretty ruthless what can happen who else i'm currently working in uh, sales and financial planning um, industry and i'm also uh, currently taking a marketing course um, and with my industry, I'm, I'm my own boss, um, but at the same time I work under people. Um, my question was, how important is a personal brand um, for you know yourself, and as a business owner, how important is a company brand, and do you ever see your personal brand and your company brand one to one? Yeah, well, there's a lot of answers to that question. So uh, if you can do it and you're successful, personal and company brand gets elevated if you do it and you don't succeed you know and, and, and creating a company brand if you take a marketing classes you know is expensive and costs a lot of money now there's and the other thing is you know it used to be you could do a, a newspaper ad everybody here know what a newspaper is uh, you could do things like that and you could budget that in and it was easy to do now you're bombarded with so many different things from Facebook to LinkedIn to whatever out there doing advertising now. Uh, it's, it can be very expensive to building a brand. But what, what I've done, and I won't tell you it's the perfect way to do it, but what I've done is your personal brand and your company brand can elevate with little to no cost if you do what you say you'll do. Okay, the greatest compliment I've ever gotten was this guy I didn't even know, and he was looking at like 10 different companies, and I went out there with a sales guy, and um, we were sitting in front of him, and, and I was just, I'm, you guys probably caught on by now, I just kind of say it as it is, and pretty plain spoken, I, I'm not real polished, I don't make big fabulous presentations and things like that, but the guy looked me in the eye, and he says, I'm going to go do business with you, and I said, if you don't mind, tell me why. He goes, I just feel like I can trust you. That's the greatest marketing or advertisement you can get if people start saying stuff like that about you. And because, guess what? Business people know multitudes of other business people. They may be in the Chamber of Commerce. They may be in this. All of a sudden, they're selling stuff for you. And that's how you can grow it. So does that answer? Yes. Uh, you work while you're in school? Correct. I did the same thing. Shake your hand. It's not easy. My grades suffered from it, but I still graduated. <laughs> Who else? When you first started your career, what were some of your priorities that projected you to be successful today? Well, probably not a great answer to that, but I gra What was that question? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to ask that, wasn't I? What was, uh, when I started my career, what were some of my priorities and, and objections, and did I meet those and so forth? So, uh, I graduated in 1980. Uh, when people talk about 20, uh, 27, uh, 2008, 2010, whatever being bad economies, I'm going to tell you there's never been a worse economy than in the 80s because nobody was doing interest anything. Interest rates were like 21, 23 percent. You couldn't you couldn't afford to borrow money even if you could borrow it. Unemployment was 18% or something. And so when I went out and interviewed, and, and the thing I learned about you guys, you guys get prepped for all this stuff, and that's, I mean, that's awesome. A school does that. We just got a degree, and we went out and started going through newspapers and applying for jobs. And so my objective was to get a job. Uh, I can't tell you, uh, I flew to Florida, flew to Pittsburgh, uh, mostly Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Louisville, and Lexington interviewing 
and I got down to the sometimes the second, but usually the last three. Everything was in person then. We didn't have video conferencing and all that. And I would lose a job to somebody that already had 10, 20 years experience doing the same thing, and I had zero experience. So it was hard. So I was just telling Lee when we were talking well, earlier, my first job I took was with Sylvania, and I traveled central and eastern Kentucky. Anybody know who Sylvania even is? They used to make IC chips, transistors, light bulbs, uh, things like that. Uh, I don't even know if they're still in business or not, are they? I used to work for the light bulb division. They're not in business. <laughs> so, but anyway, I made $14,000 a year and was glad to get the job. And I had to pay my student loan back out of that because once you get a job, you got to start paying your loan back. And I uh, uh, lived in Lexington, had an apartment. So, I mean, you know, I was just, I was just getting by. So, um, the, uh, but I had a job. And, uh, I was glad of it. I, I learned a lot. Um, I, I learned that even though I was from Eastern Kentucky, I got no favor from other people in Eastern Kentucky because they'd been uh, uh, quick sold and, and told stories from people from the big city, you know, and never came through with them and whatever. So uh, long story on that, but you got to start somewhere. You guys are not in that position now. You know, I mean, I don't know what the going salary is, but I'm going to say it's at least 30 or 35 minimum. You probably would like even more than that. But let me also tell you this. Uh, I took a job one time um, to get, I wanted to change industries, and I got in the telecom industry, and I was getting to go get paid 35000 plus commission. And uh, when I was talking over with my wife, 35000 wouldn't cover our monthly bills. So um, I had to roll the dice and count on that commission. And so that's when I met the guy from Egypt selling long distance credit cards and, and you know, stories, how tall. So anyway, working hard will get you through. Don't let your, if, if you feel like there's a job, even if it's less, uh, but it's what you, it really sound like a good company, really sounds like a good fit. Don't let yourself be swayed by somebody giving you a little bit more if, if the other one sounds better. Um, don't call me if it doesn't work out. But <laughs> I, I would just tell you from experience, um, you got to go with your heart. Do what you think's right. You got a question? Oh, look like you're going to ask a question. Oh. Thank you, guys. And uh, wish you all the best. Go home and dream tonight. Before we do that, we want to present a little something to you. Um, you know, Eastern's often been called a school of opportunity, and there are a lot of different answers as to what that means. Um, the way I've always liked to look at it is that wherever you start from, whatever you want to do, we can help you get from here to there. And Dale, you're a first-generation college student. Yeah. When the president asked at graduation in December how many of you are first-generation, we're going to have over a third of the graduating class stand up today. That's still really? true. That's still true today. So whether uh, someone comes with it being the first in their, in their family to go to college or whether you have many people who have been, uh, you know, Dale's an inspiration of you can do a lot of things. Uh, okay. Founder of several companies, an outstanding sales guy, and we want to just present you with a little, little plaque to remember this day. Dale Cooper, Distinguished Alum, College of Business and Technology, Eastern Kentucky University, uh, representing the Department of Management, Marketing, and International Business. So on behalf of the, the Dean, Dean Erickson, uh, and the Department of International Management Marketing and International Business, we want to present this to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. If anybody's got anything you want to ask me or whatever at some time, um, Lee can give you the my email. Or you can go on LinkedIn and look me up. I'm glad to help anybody I can. Just remember, you get what you pay for.